open forum. This is due to the large number of panelists and limited time. Speaking of limited time, we will do our best to stay within the prescribed times of the agenda. Open forum will be at the end of the meeting. If you intend to speak during today's open forum, please raise your hand or press star nine on your phone so we can gauge how much time will be needed. Finally, closed caption has been enabled on Zoom. Please turn on this feature if needed. Thank you so much for my community service announcement. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ninth Vision Zero Task Force meeting for the City of San Jose. Also the last task force meeting on this calendar year. I'm Council Member Pam Foley, and this is my first meeting as chair. I've been involved as vice chair since it started in September 2020. As you may know, Council Member Perales is leaving office at the end of the year. So sad, but eight years is eight years. I'd like to express my sincerest appreciation to Council Member Perales and his leadership as the first and founding San Jose Vision Zero Task Force Chair. It's been clear to me that you take your role very seriously. You care deeply about traffic safety and you do what you believe is right for the city and our communities. For this meeting, Council Member Perales will serve as vice chair. So a little twist up there. The next vice chair will be selected for the next meeting in the first quarter of 2023. 
Before we get started, I'd like to take a few minutes to remember the 17 people who have died on our streets in San Jose since our last task force meeting on August 31st to November 29th. Just a reminder, these are members of our community. They are family and friends, brothers and sisters who were taken far too soon. In some cases, their names have not yet been released. I'm going to call out nine names of road traffic victims and Councilmember Perales will call out the names of, of the eight victims. Male motorist, male motorcyclist, Jaime Lopez Perez pedestrian, male pedestrian, male motorcyclist, Jacob Villanueva, pedestrian. Ruben Razo Jr., bicyclist. Female, motorist. Male, motorcyclist. Male, pedestrian. Male, bicyclist. Female, pedestrian. Melvin Boone, pedestrian. Camden McWright, bicyclist, male pedestrian, male motorcyclist, female motorist. Thank you. We are on track to set a record for the number of fatalities on our streets this year. This is not a record we want to break. So the efforts of this Vision Zero Task Force and the Department of Transportation and all of our partners is extremely important in reducing those number of fatalities. Vision Zero is an effort that brings data analysis and community outreach together to better understand which safety projects and strategic cross department initiatives are the most impactful at reducing crashes severe and fatal injuries, and to prioritize safety projects and infrastructure improvements based on the data and community feedback. Today, we're going to discuss the work plan for the next year, 2023, including Vision Zero Task Force Strategic Plan and Outreach. There's also a presentation from MIG, the consultant working on the Vision Zero Strategic Communication and Safety Messaging. Throughout today's meeting, I encourage the task force members to actively participate in this discussion as it will help us form the strategic plan for 2023. I also encourage task force members to think creatively about how they or their departments can help address reducing traffic injuries and fatalities by working together. As we will highlight in today's agenda, traffic fatalities are up and reducing them needs our joint efforts. There will be a task force member discussion after each presentation, 15 minutes after reports and updates, where we will hear about the traffic fatality data and the work plan for 2023. And then also after the MIG presentation, that will be followed by open forum for the public comment. At this time, I'd like to do a roll call. I'll be calling out the department or organization name, and if the representative could say their name and title, that would be most appreciated. Of course, there's myself, there's the vice mayor, or vice, <laughs> vice mayor just gave you promotion, vice chair, uh, City of San Jose Transportation. Lily Lynn, South Deputy Director. City of San Jose Police Department. Sergeant Douglas Gates, Traffic Enforcement Unit. Thank you. City of San Jose Fire Department. James Williams, Assistant Fire Chief. Thank you. City of San Jose Public Works. Uh, Christy Chung, uh, Public Works. Thank you. City of San Jose Parks. Neil Rafino, Assistant Director. Thanks, Neil. City of San Jose Economic Development. Sal Alvarez, Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Thank you. City of San Jose Planning. City of San Jose Housing. 
Good morning, Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. Welcome, Re welcome, Reagan. We had a late night last night. VTA, County Department of Roads and Airports. Hi, good morning, Harry Freitas, County Roads. Welcome, Harry. County Public Health Department. Oh, I understand they're not able to attend. County Emergency Medical Services. County Medical Examiner, Coroner. Hello, Candace Garcia, Analyst, Medical Examiner, Coroner's Office. Thank you. County Office of Education. Cal Walks is not able to join us. Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. Diana Krebity, Associate Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement. And AARP. Good morning, Joe Glenn, City of uh, ARP, San Jose Advocacy Team. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming and, and being in attendance. And I hope you have your uh, thinking caps on and are willing uh, and able to participate if, if, uh, if you're inspired to do so. This meeting, the meeting minutes of the last Vision Zero Task Force meeting on August 31st were posted on the Vision Zero website. You may reach out to staff directly with any comments you may have. Next, we have a little thank you slide for Council Member Perales. Before I'd like, I begin, I'd like to thank Council Member Perales again for his vision and his passion for making our streets safe and for leading the meetings in the last couple of years in a very capable and sensitive way. And I wanna highlight the forum that he held earlier this year that was impactful, effective, and brought out a lot of community mem members with really great ideas. Hope to continue on with something additionally like that this year or this coming year. On the slide, staff and task force members have provided words that describe Council Member Perales. So I'm just gonna read a couple of them that jump out to me. And it's not because they're some of the biggest words, but they truly are important when I think of Council Member Perales. He's a champion, he's a leader, he's committed to his community and he's a visionary. And I want to say personally, I respect the work that he has done over the last eight years. And I have learned so much in the way that he works to bring a coalition and collaboration for both the council, but also on this task force. So thank you for your inspiring leadership, Council Member Perales. I'd thank like you. to take thank time actually, <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to take time for everybody to say a few words, but we don't have that. We are having a little special gathering afterwards at 1130. So please join us there if you're able to at City Hall. And we can all uh, give hugs and celebrate Councilman Perales in person. For agenda item two, we have reports and updates from Jesse Mintz-Roth, who will give us some updates on the Vision Zero Key Matrix, update on the Vision Zero Action Plan and the Work Plan for 2023. Task Force members' discussion follows this presentation. Jesse, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair Foley. Um, I will begin with the traffic uh, collision trends for 2022. And of course, just as you have, I want to acknowledge before I start that the numbers in these slides will be describing our San Jose families and friends uh, who are sad to um, have lost in this way. Um, so beginning here, uh, many of you have seen me talk about this before, but I just want to reiterate uh, that in the last 10 years, traffic fatalities have doubled from 29 uh, in 2012 to 60 in 2015, 2019, and 2021. In the pandemic years, we've seen a lot of variability. 2020 was a low year, as was the first half of 2021, but the second half of 2021 and into the beginning of 2022, we've seen much higher fatalities than usual. And today, on this last day of November, we are at the peak number that we have had in the highest years to date, which is 60, and there's still one month to go of 2022. 
And what was different in 2022 was starting off the year with many more traffic fatalities than usual. And this slide highlights uh, where that was. You can see in the first quarter of 2022 that we had a 167% increase over 2021. The yellow line shows a steeper slope than usual from January to April. This period included three people dying at the intersection of Almaden Expressway and Foxworthy, uh, two people walking in the same crash uh, and in January, and then a third person cycling uh, in February. There was also a second double pedestrian fatality at Ocala Avenue and Oakton Court in April. And then I, it's worthy to note that we are seeing similar findings from other cities and states. In the national data, the National Highway Tra uh, Traffic Safety Administration, called NHTSA, reported a 7% increase in traffic fatalities in the first quarter of 2022 compared to the previous year, and a 20% increase uh, from, 2020, from 2020 reaching a 20-year high. So looking back to 2022 quarter one, uh, California was up 6% over the previous year, but looking at other Bay Area cities, Oakland is seeing a 78% increase uh, in the first quarter of 2022 over the previous year, and uh, as we mentioned, San Jose has a 67% increase effectively. Um, in San Jose, the second and third quarters of 2022, uh, notably the slope was a lot less steep. Uh, then also not both in comparison to the first quarter of 2022, but also in comparison to the same quarters in 2021. Um, so looking more specifically at the 2022 trends, uh, we are trending towards a record high for traffic fatalities, and more of them involve people hit while walking, now 50% uh, of the total. So 59% uh, let me just make sure that I'm on the same. 60% occurred in darkness, uh, many of them in the first few months of the year that started off 2022, which is higher than usual. Um, but I will say that since 2019, the city has been using changeable message signs on major roadways. Um, just make sure this goes away. Um, just a moment. Okay. Um, and... Sorry, I just have a lot of notifications popping up. Sorry about that. Uh, but we have been using changeable message signs on major roadways, particularly those design designated as priority safety corridors to alert drivers to slow down and coordinating with the police department to do enforcement uh, in the same time of year, November to March, which we're currently in the darkest time of the year. Um, in 2022, we started working with PRNS and the housing department to distribute flashlights and reflective vests to people experiencing homelessness. Um, and there is, I will say on this slide, a large number of people and a continued trend of fatalities involving people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, one of the call out areas on here is the percentage of fatalities occurring on our streets designated as priority safety corridors, that's 32%, but also a much larger percent, 82%, the roadways uh, with that have a posted speed limit of 35 miles an hour or higher most of our priority safety corridors do. So it's important to acknowledge that our, our speeds, our roadways that have high speeds posted um, are also the place that a lot of fatalities are happening. Looking at specific roads, uh, White Road and Santa Teresa Boulevard are the individual roadways this year that have the most fatalities. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, just people walking, as I mentioned before, uh, they are 50% of the fatalities and a large percentage of them are people who are outside of marked crosswalks, which can be uh, close to the crosswalk or far from the crosswalk, but that's one of the areas that we're looking to address through our work. Um, and just finally, the, the last thing is I want to say is that speeding is the top known factor contributing to fatal and severe injuries, and that is also this year a large area 23 percent or 14 of the 60 fatalities so for this slide uh, which is about the adult crossing guard program i'm going to uh, hand the mic over to sergeant uh, doug gates from the police department uh, thank you very much jesse uh, and now that we're incorporating school safety uh, specifically vehicular and pedestrian safety around our schools 
I uh, just want to touch on our adult crossing guard program, which is our highest visibility uh, for safety and probably the greatest number of resources uh, dedicated to safety. Um, currently, there are 262 funded positions. We have uh, an average of, or well, at least current, of 77 vacancies uh, of those positions. Some of the challenges um, they are facing is, is staffing, as with everything. Um, a very high turnover rate, um, only a certain population is available to work the split shift. Uh, they work a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the afternoon. Um, some of the other challenges is um, during COVID, uh, they saw a large reduction in staffing uh, just because it is an at-risk community and they wanted to avoid uh, as much contact with, with, with people to avoid becoming sick. Um, and that kind of leads into the, the fall season as we get into cold and flu season. Uh, they are anticipating additional uh, vacancies as people take time off to avoid uh, getting or in contact with, with ill people. Um, currently, there are 121 authorized locations uh, in the city that are staffed by our crossing guards. Uh, of that 121, only 100 are staffed, um, and that is due uh, directly in the lack of staffing. Thank you. Is anything else, Jesse, on that? Um, I think we may have lost Sergeant Cates on audio. So um... oh, okay, <laughs> that was abrupt. I was, <laughs> I was waiting for some sort of conclusion. <laughs> okay, well, I I think what we could... Gates, it looks like you're unmute or you're muted again. Are you? Will you finish with your presentation? Can you hear me? Okay, I can, we can now. Hear you. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, where did I where did I lose you at? I forgot. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, current staffing, well, I think we've covered you, you, that. You had just mentioned that the 21 vacancies were due to just lack of staffing. Yeah. And then you we're ready. You were just hitting on the budget, I think. Uh, yeah, the, the issue, according to speaking with Michelle Barté, the, uh, the coordinator of the program, um, it is not a budgetary issue because they are currently budgeted for 262 positions. Uh, the issue is just finding staffing and available people to actually uh, work those split shifts. And did we cover the the number of of authorized locations and the ones that are short? No, we did okay. not discuss the intersections. So currently, there are 121 uh, authorized locations uh, for for crossing guards to be staffed. Uh, as of recent, there's only 100 locations that are currently staffed. Um, leaving obviously 20 to 21 uh, vacant uh, authorized locations where they should be. And again, that's not a, a budgetary issue from my understanding. It is just a strictly staffing issue. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I also am going to switch. So now I'm back on and um, I wanted to uh, present a little bit about our Fatality Review Board, which we've never discussed publicly before, but uh, is an initiative that we created internally in the Department of Transportation uh, in the fall of 2020. And this is a initiative to review uh, the information that we get from the police department on crash reports, which are, um, we, can we can never share them outside DOT. They can only be reviewed inside DOT. But uh, we have so far reviewed 111 traffic fatalities um, from their police reports, six in 2020, 60, all 60 in 2021, and 45 so far in 2022. Um, I should say that, you know, it takes some time for the police department to write up the report. So that's why there's a lag time in why uh, we haven't done all of the ones so far from 2022. And we're interested to engage task force member departments as part of this process. And uh, during uh, the exercise that we'll be discussing a little bit more coming up, there may be opportunities to think about how to do this in our work plan for 2023. Um, but we just wanted to introduce what we do so far. Uh, we have a meeting and implementation process. So in the meeting that we hold internally in DOT, which brings in people from our operations department as well as planning, um, we meet to just identify the causes of the crash to go through the crash report to look at the site when possible, 
uh, and definitely look at it, you know, online, but sometimes also on site visits. Um, and we identify potential mitigation and enhancements to reduce the risk of crashes there in the future. And then we basically go work through to identify methods of delivery. And so we can either leverage the current program, which means that we can make improvements relatively quickly, uh, or for some more costly improvements, they may require grant funding, which we have to go through the process of applying for and uh, hopefully winning and receiving. So those take longer. But uh, there have been others that can be improved, that can be delivered through the pavement program and also through development that comes online through the city. Uh, when, when developers build things, the city has the opportunity to ask them to build things near their property. So sometimes there's a intersection of those locations and, uh, and where crash related safety improvements are desired. So uh, for our work plan for 2023, as I just mentioned, uh, we have new leadership and we're uh, going to be creating a new work plan for the task force in 2023, which will kick off with an internal exercise where we invite the task force members to work with us to help us put this together. Some of the themes that we anticipate are engagement and outreach, uh, such as some of the images you see here uh, from our changeable message boards and from putting signs out in the street to encourage people to cross in the crosswalk or be more visible. Um, so we anticipate uh, pedestrian visibility uh, and also school safety, which is the subject of the next few slides. So um, to pass the mic to uh, Chair Foley. Thank you. I want to circle back on some of the topics. Or, whoops, whoops, I'm missing my script. Sorry about that. So in uh, thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Officer Gates, for your presentations. I, I look forward to digging into that a little bit. In October, I co-authored a memorandum along with May, the mayor, the vice mayor Jones and council member Cohen in light of the tragic incident near Castlemont Elementary, where young Jacob Villanueva lost his life. The Department of Transportation is taking some actions to improve the safety at the specific intersections, which will be covered in a bit. But myself and my colleagues felt that a more long-term and holistic vision was necessary to prioritize safe routes to schools. The memorandum, which was accepted by Rules Committee on October 19th, calls for our task force to incorporate safe routes to school and safety near schools into the Vision Zero Task Force work plan, which we will discuss at our March meeting uh, next year. Safe routes to school has always been a part of our discussion around Vision Zero. I'd like to thank Mary Ann Duan from the County Office of Education for her participation in this task force. But I feel that the school safety should be addressed more directly by the Vision Zero Task Force. And as a former school board member for 14 years, I can tell you this is an area of extreme concern and interest to me as I'm very concerned about parent driving and other driving around our school sites. We've also asked for staff to work on ways to accelerate filling the many vacancies we have in our budgeted school crossing guard positions. I wanna thank the police department for the presentation on crossing guards and filling in some of the gaps. Certain items from our memorandum will need to go to priority setting to be considered by the full council, such as developing metrics for school safety and deploying traffic calming near school sites. Ultimately, the purpose of this memo was, as it relates to the task force, is to get our committee members to think of school safety and how it can be incorporated into our work plan for the coming year. Jesse, I'm going to turn it over to you for a minute. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, finally finish up the school safety topic by talking about uh, the area and the fatality of the third grader who died on September 16th at Castlemont Elementary. Um, following this untimely fatality, um, we, we want, DOT is committed to developing a school area safety plan 
And the safety improvements delivered near the school um, are illustrative of the types of improvements that could also be delivered near other schools. Um, these include in the area upgrading five crosswalks to high visibility, which is the treatment that you see in this image with the ladder. Um, and also refreshing markings on five streets around the school, uh, installing two new stop controls at nearby intersections, the intersection of Castlemont and Driftwood, and soon the intersection of Driftwood and Teakwood. And trims, uh, trees were also trimmed at the intersection of Castlewood, Castlemont and Driftwood uh, to improve visibility. So um, that is the last slide that we have on school safety. Great, now I will open it up for the task force discussion, which we've allowed 15 minutes for this. And I'd like the task force to think about filling those adult crossing guard positions, the fatality review board, and any themes that we should be considering for an upcoming strategic planning meeting. If, you're, if you have any comments, please raise your hand and I'll call on you and we can discuss, have a discussion around this. I have a couple of questions as well, but I will start with the task force members. Vice Chair, Council, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the, the presentation and update. Um, it was important, I think, to, to understand what the vacancies look like in crossing guards. I, I have to believe a city our size has enough people out there that may be retired, right, or, or, or have an opportunity to, to fill into those roles if they knew that uh, the vacancies existed. Hearing that it wasn't a budgetary issue, right, that those those positions are, are funded. Um, I previously thought, you know, that, that this was more of a funding kind of battle, right, that, that you're prioritizing the, some of the needs. It, and, and it doesn't sound like that. Um, rather, it sounds like, you know, we, we just don't have enough bodies to fill some of those holes. And granted, the city has a challenge, and we've had a challenge with vacancies and prioritizing onboarding. And so I, I recognize that, that that in itself brings a challenge. But I do think um, this broad, you know, task force could probably help in, in just the, the awareness of those vacancies, right, and the opportunities that may exist. We have marketing efforts that we have engaged in. And so that was my question actually for, for DOT staff. Um, what, what might it look like to incorporate some of this info, right? For instance, you know, the vacancy of crossing guards or something that this task force could be provided that was a uniform type of announcement, uh, if you will, or awareness, um, and, and, and then could share that amongst our networks and try to recruit more people to apply for those vacancies. Thank you. Who's going to take that? Um, I, I can start there, Councilman. Okay, Bowman. Lily, thank you. Th thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the ways, uh, at least a couple of ways that we can certainly incorporate into our messaging in our in our day to day um, DOT public awareness uh, campaign or um, public blogs is to include the announcements. Um, I I'll talk to our PIO, Colin, to help elevate these vacancies and advertise it in a way that that really focus on the school surrounding the, the how the community can come together to improve safety for our communities um and i i think that's made, that could be a easy lift for us to do um i know we've got some of our task force members who do regular uh, messaging and public outreach that we could also send the similar message to and to share with um, BTA, AARP, um, I think there's quite a few of us here that have access to that. And the council member news, uh, districts uh, newsletters that I think would be a great way to get the words out. So um, Sergeant Gates, if we can, if you can connect us with Michelle, with some, uh, a, a, maybe a paragraph of the job description and where some of the uh, spots are available, I think in my interest, those who live in the area with the vacancies to say, hey, I, I live right here and I may be interested. So those are a couple of, uh, a few ways I think about how we can uh, elevate this vacancy announcements. Thank you, that was it. Thank you, just to follow up on that, I know we have a 
a couple task force members, but I just wanted to follow up on that. We have a, in my uh, newsletter and through social media, we have pushed out the need for crossing guards, but what I'm finding uh, that is, I don't know if it's working, but if we could have a list of in each district of which schools need crossing guards, because then we can go to the local school and target, do a little bit more targeting marketing because the people who, they wanna work at the schools. The parents may have the time who have, the, have kids in those schools and they may not know there's a vacancy or an ability for them to work for a couple of hours. So anything you can do to provide us with good information that we can then use and, and solicit. I know I have a cross a crosswalk on Lee Avenue that is in need of crossing guards. And so we have a couple of schools nearby that we can reach out to those parents. We haven't been successful yet, but we're still, it's very helpful for them to know that. And it also, uh, you know, for grandparents, they may want to be there to help out their grandkids crossing the street. Although being a crossing guard is, um, becoming a high risk position as we know. Um, th so thank you, anything we can do to provide us with good information or more information that would help us do some targeting advertising would be helpful. Reagan, welcome. Thanks council member. And you, uh, that was one of my comments about targeting specific schools. Um, I think at, there's opportunity there to reach out to parents and grandparents. Um, who might have a few hours to spare and have a vested interest in um, ensuring safety around their schools. My other comment Thanks. was um, around the fatality review board. Um, I know a number of fatalities have been unhoused individuals. I'd be happy to participate in that review board, but what I was thinking uh, could be even better is someone with lived experience of homelessness um, who yes. has an understanding of what people are going through and um, would provide, I think, a valuable perspective. Um, so I might also be able to help um, with that. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Reagan. Yeah, thank you. Neil, before I call on you, I do want to identify three people from the task force who came in after I made the introductions. And that is uh, Lauren Ledbetter with VTA, welcome. Michelle Wexler with the County Public Health Department and Jackie Lowther with the County Emergency Medical Services. Welcome. Okay, Neil. Thank you, council member. Um, I was just gonna uh, offer the support of Park and Rec for outreach on that. Um, if we can get uh, both social media uh, document as well as a hard copy document, we can hand it out at all of our senior centers um, you know, to get uh, our seniors uh, more information. And the other recommendation I have is um, there's a quarterly school cities collaborative meeting with um, the superintendents that the uh, library manages. Uh, so Jill Bourne, the director would be the best contact, but uh, I know the school districts and superintendents are very, very, as everyone here should know, every very uh, interested in the crossing guards program. Uh, it's one of their top priorities. So being able to share information about the vacancies at the school state collaborative will help uh, put out that information to their schools. Great, thank you, Neil. Joe. Uh, thank you, uh, very informative uh, uh, update. Uh, Representing ARP, we certainly would uh, be interested in helping uh, communicate uh, the need for adult crossing guards uh, using, uh, uh, we have 71,000 numbers uh, within residing within the city of San Jose. So uh, certainly an outreach in that area. Uh, also um, at the last quarterly meeting, it was uh, discussed the increasing number of older adults, uh, particularly pedestrians that are impacted. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I personally would be interested in um, uh, understanding a little bit better uh, the profile of uh, those pedestrian fatalities. And so I'd be interested in uh, volunteering for uh, some of that uh, 
uh, uh, engagement for uh, fatality review uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Diana. Hello. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we can definitely support Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. We do an outreach every Friday to um, residents within Santa Clara County and San Mateo County and make sure that they knew that this opportunity was available. So we definitely have a, our support on board. Um, I also want to, to let everyone know, I um, want to invite them to, the, to an infrastructure bike ride that's going to be taking place in January. Um, to showcase some of the, the stark differences between infrastructure and affluent neighborhoods like Willow Glen or Natalie Park versus underserved communities and these sites such as Mayfair. Um, and the reason being would be to show why some neighborhoods have highly uh, a higher rate of collision over those um, communities that um, aren't facing as much uh, uh, are, are as uh, as overrepresented in the in the fatalities. Uh, so I just want to invite you all out there. Sometimes we always say it's easier to to show someone what's going on than to tell them. So this is the opportunity to, to see things um, up front. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Is there anything that we should be doing to engage the, the different members of this task force collectively to address not just the school safety, but other areas that we wanna take a look at? I'd like to know if, if any of the departments, how, how do you in, uh, distribute any information? Do you have events? Do you do tabling where you put out Vision Zero information or safety issues? Any ideas if, that, you, that you're willing to share right now would be helpful. Also, any, are there any efforts that we could leverage to increase safety awareness around our schools? Just some, some words for thought out there. And I, I will say that it's not just our schools that need safe streets, obviously. We need them all over. My husband bikes to work every day, and I worry about him getting home safely every night because there's a lot of uh, distracted drivers out there. So I see no other hands raised. Okay, Neil, you just popped up. Yes, uh, just in terms of uh, maybe some programs. If uh, DOT has any youth specific um, like workshops that they sense, uh, you know, a team out there, we have, you know, after school programs all across the city that we would, uh, in, you know, allow for guest speakers to come in and talk to the kids about, you know, safe, uh, uh, pass it back into and from school. So um, I'm not too sure if, if there is a program like that, but we have that ability to raise yeah, th Thanks for offering us as well. I, I think uh, that'd be a great opportunity for us to connect our school safety um, programs and officer who does the education work and get out there and start talking to teenagers. And some of those might be interested in, in traffic engineering enough that they might consider uh, when they move on to the college level to do internship with the city and, and help with our safety program. So that's a great idea. Thank you. I will follow up with you on the after school program. Thank you. Any further discussion on this particular item? I, I was just going to add that the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs does have a newsletter that goes out. Uh, we host guest bloggers. So if, if DOT has some uh, a blog or some kind of information that we could include in that. This mainly goes out to our business community, um, but which we have lots of business district corridors that are um, business zero corridors. So happy to do that. Um, and then just one other idea. Um, I believe the county convenes a PTA sort of roundtable of all the different PTAs in the for the for each school district. So that might be another way to reach into schools is do the PTAs. And those tend to be the, the folks that are engaged in their schools. Actually, that's a great idea. I think it's the sixth council district, they call it, uh, yeah. PTA council district, that they meet regularly. And uh, this is one of the issues I'm sure that they would be interested in. Um, is, is Sergeant Gates still on? Yes. I have a yes, question. I am. I, I just have a question for you about the split shift. Have we ever considered changing that from maybe allowing a person to have the morning shift and then another person to have an eve after the afternoon shift? 
Uh, I'm not sure, positively speaking, but I'm sure they have offered that because just in the, the limitations and challenges they face for staffing, I'm sure they're they're willing to take whoever can work, whatever they can work. Okay. So if that's an option, that might open up flexibility for some parents too, or uh, grandparents who only walk, want to work in the morning or want to work in the afternoon, depending on their schedule. So it's, it's good to know, because I know that split schedule is hard. You can't really budget your day. You have to work two hours here and then two hours there. Thank you, or an hour, whatever, whatever the time frame is. All right, seeing no more hands, let's move to the next presentation. There is one presentation and that is on the um, messaging. So we have Deanna Chow Trotter from MIG. They have been working on the Vision Zero Safety messaging contract. They've been working for DOT for about a year and we're nearing and are nearing release of a campaign. The VTA and the County Public Health Department have been partners on this work, which is part of our Vision Zero Action Plan. As a reminder, the 2020 Vision Zero Action Plan has six areas. Build robust data analytic tools, form a Vision to Zero Task Force, we've done that, strategize traffic enforcement, increase community outreach and engagement, implement quick build data-driven safety improvements and focus resources on high fatality and severe injury corridors and districts. This professional safety messaging campaign work is part of action plan area four to increase outreach and engagement. Working with a professional messaging consultancy to encourage public behavior, change is a new practice area for San Jose DOT. It complements the DOT's existing safety messaging activities like putting out changeable message signs that we saw earlier when it's darker out at commute times and its street redesign efforts under area five, including building pedestrian safety enhancements like flashing beacons and pedestrian crosswalks. I'd like to thank the task force members to, I'd like, the task force members to consider thinking about areas that this effort complements in their department work that we could leverage when this campaign work is released for the conversation that follows this presentation. With that, I will introduce Deanna Chow Trotter from MIG. Thank you very much, Chair Foley and Vice Chair. Uh, Perales and members of the Vision Zero Task Force. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, i am uh, been part of the consulting team leading this communications effort. And uh, we've, we've been working with the Vision Zero team. I'll, I'll often refer to them in this um, presentation. And that group is comprised of representatives of the city of San Jose, uh, council member offices, uh, Santa Clara County, including the Department of Public Health and VTA. So I will share my screen. Can everyone see? I don't know if, are you seeing? We, we got, yes, we are, we got it. Okay, you're not, but you're not seeing, I have the folks. Um, okay, you can't see yourself though, because <laughs> I can see. Okay, wonderful. Um, so for this presentation, um, I have just um, these objectives for uh, this short time. One is to provide a quick project overview of our communications um, efforts so far, um, giving you a quick sense of what we've done so far, where we are today, and what's ahead. Um, and then the main event is for us to present our campaign strategy for your review and consideration. And then um, giving you some sense of what will happen in the coming months um, as we move forward. And then, of course, the most important part is to gather uh, task force feedback on our strategy. So in terms of the project overview, uh, my colleague Rebecca Graham back in August uh, presented, you may recognize this timeline um, of our project. Uh, we've been through a research phase that started this whole project. Um, and then when she presented back in August, we were looking at sharing with you the results 
um, from our research studies and then how that contributed to the rationale and criteria for selecting speeding as the issue for issue focused for this campaign. And now we are squarely in the campaign development phase. Um, and that is um, focused on this strategy that we're going to present today and the idea of moving toward a campaign launch sometime in the spring of next year. Um, as part of the action plan, um, this overall effort is about developing a data-driven multi-touchpoint campaign that raises awareness of Vision Zero in San Jose and promotes safe streets or safer streets. Um, and to that end, we've conducted baseline research through the two studies. Um, we've selected this campaign focus on the issue of speeding. And then once we selected the speeding um, focus, we conducted focus groups, um, gathering various groups um, to ask about their opinions, attitudes, motivations around uh, this speeding topic and issues around driving in San Jose. And that's led to uh, this proposed strategy that we're presenting today. Um, part of sharing this slide is also to say that um, these research studies that we've done have all contributed, contributed and also undergird the strategy that we're proposing today. And as I share the various elements of the strategy, I'm going to uh, include research support so that there's an understanding of where um, these decisions are, are coming from. So with that, um, I'll move into the campaign strategy. And as a communications professional, I often have to remind myself that not everyone thinks about communications in this way. So I wanted to start this section with just giving a quick overview of what is a campaign strategy. Um, in short, I think the simplest way to, to define it is that it's a blueprint or a plan for developing an effective campaign. And it seeks to answer a number of different questions. Uh, we want to define our objective. What is the outcome that we want from the campaign? Um, our audience, who are we addressing? Who are we trying to influence in order to gain this outcome? And then content and tone. What and how are we going to communicate to this audience to achieve this outcome? And then um, there's a combination of audience and touch points. You know, how do we reach the target audience through what types of touch points, whether it be billboards or digital ads, um, the various ways that we all as consumers of the public um, receive messages, um, how will we reach our audience and how will we distribute messages to reach them? So uh, specifically for the Safer Speeds campaign, we've defined the following overarching objective, which is to increase awareness of the dangers of speeding and the value of safe speeds, speed limits among San Jose's diverse communities. And that includes promoting speed limits and safer driving speeds in San Jose, as well as compliance with speed limits. And then a couple secondary um, objectives is to facilitate self-awareness or increase self-awareness and self-consciousness around speeding behaviors. And I'll speak to that a little bit more as I share some of the research that we uncovered. Um, and ultimately, as we achieve um, increased awareness around the dangers of speeding, we hope to increase support and advocacy for safer speed pro projects and initiatives. So some of the research um, that have con that's contributed to these objectives, um, one is just how we came about deciding that speeding was the issue that we wanted to focus on for this campaign. And you may recall this slide from our August presentation that Rebecca made, where uh, the crash profiles that Fair and Peers developed, uh, the eight um, top crash profiles in the city, uh, all of them had speeding as one of their top violations. So, um, so that made it very clear. Um, in addition, the opinion research survey we did, um, there were 77% of respondents that agreed that it would be safer for people walking and biking in San Jose if people drove more slowly. And similarly, 71% agreed that speeding is the leading cause of traffic collisions in San Jose. 
And then as we moved into focus group research, this um, occurred in September, uh, there was limited unaided recognition of speeding as a significant traffic safety issue. And I know that might be kind of a jumble of words, um, but unaided meaning that we asked an open-ended question. Um, there's a combination of what's your least favorite thing about getting around in San Jose. This is all um, speaking to drivers. And what is the biggest frustration you have um, about driving in San Jose? And uh, most people, their first response had to do with traffic. And only as we probed a little further did speeding be become more uh, rise to the surface in terms of recognition of this being a problem. So um, I think that in combination with what we learned from the opinion research, there is a bit of a disconnect, this uh, need to raise awareness around speeding. So um, our campaign audience, uh, not surprising, is drivers in San Jose. Um, as we know from our research, um, speeding is being uh, perpetrated across the, the city and that 91% of San Jose residents drive a car at least once a week. So um, this population um, that we're, uh, for the, this audience population for the campaign is quite large. And as I move forward um, in these slides, we have um, some more thoughts about targeting or how do we segment, further segment this very large group um, and audience so that we can be more effective, especially given limited budgets and resources. Um, next is um, some of our thinking around campaign content and tone. And um, in this case, I'm presenting the research support first. Um, because that really contributed to our thinking and decisions around content and tone. Um, in the focus group research, we found that most respondents, they only considered uh, a behavior as speeding if it was reckless, and they thought of it as something done on freeways only. Mm. Um, and we also found that respondents across all groups were quite open about exceeding the speed limit and they were slow to think that it was wrong. And there's um, a fair amount of rationale about um, going with the flow of traffic and that actually is more safe than going more slowly. Um, so these are all things that we wanna address as we move into developing this campaign. So for the messaging, we want to connect unsafe speeds to city and residential road driving. Um, it may not be that we're going to define speeding um, literally, but the idea that slowing down is important in the city and not that it's speeding is something that only happens um, on freeways. We wanna confront attitudes among audiences where driving over the speed limit is perceived as acceptable and really convey the dangers of speeding. And then we wanna communicate a clear call to action to promote behavior change. And probably the simplest call to action we might boil down to slow down. Um, and through our focus group um, findings, uh, we, in those groups, we presented four um, sample concepts to just get their feedback. And uh, we, we had a range of messages or headlines on those ads. One was like a simple fact that speeding is the top cause of traffic fatalities. Another um, had, was coupled with an image of um, a scene of a crash uh, that said, what's the worst that could happen? And uh, respondents expressed just a desire to just give me a clear direction, just tell me what to do. So I think that has been something that has stuck with us and that's something we want to move forward with as we get into the specifics of developing creative um, messaging and visuals for the campaign. The visuals themselves, as I mentioned, there were four different um, concepts we presented and two of them had photographic imagery and that those two in particular drew the most attention. Um, they, in in showing um, something that was photorealistic, people were able to connect more personally. And also I think it conveyed the gravity of unsafe speeds versus showing uh, illustration or infographic that just didn't have the same um, effect as um, using photography. 
Um, and so even, yeah, just taking it further, folks were able to tie the issue to their own children or their own family members because they could see some reflection of themselves or their um, or reality in those images. In terms of tone, uh, we want to portray just a serious tone that this bears, this issue bears sobering consequences and calls for urgency. And then um, the other two points here, are just um, a collective sense is more maybe the spirit of the campaign, maybe not so much um, specific or literal uh, copy per se, but the idea, um, even as we work as a task force together, that we're in this together, that my actions impact others. And only as we work together, can we create change. And very well coupled with that is just a hopeful tone um, that our small decisions um, and safer choices will make a difference and will save lives. So I'm, as I mentioned before, um, the audience drivers in San Jose is very broad and with a limited budget and resources, you know, ideally, if we could go and talk to every single driver in the city, uh, we could do, you know, anything. Um, but with limitations, we want to be strategic about targeting um, this campaign, um, the messaging and the touch points that we will adopt. And ultimately, um, wanting to, as this first campaign iteration goes out, um, achieve some measurable effectiveness. Um, even there will be some learnings, I'm sure, as we go out um, that later on, as we scale this or even repeat this in other areas to uh, through other touch points, uh, we'll have increased effectiveness as we go. Um, so just to give some ideas of what we mean by targeting, uh, media placements in particular, uh, maybe these are at you know key crash locations. We have priority corridors, intersections, particular stretches of roadways or roadway types. Um, I think we've also talked a lot, and um, folks already in the previous presentation have shared that as we couple this campaign with um, speed reducing engineering projects or enforcement events that tends to um, have an even greater impact than communications alone. Communications alone will not um, be the ultimate way to impact behavior. Um, but as we work together uh, to integrate our efforts, um, we'll have a greater opportunity. Uh, the use of demographics and common attributes to target those who speed uh, while data provided by the city revealed that men between the ages of 18 and 54 were most commonly involved in speeding related crashes, this campaign will not only seek to reach out to this particular demographic, but also go beyond that specific group. Um, this behavior change campaign will be relevant to all drivers um, and will be promoting safer speeds um, among everyone knowing that anyone that's speeding can cause a crash. Um, and then just to further illustrate how this targeting in terms of a, a specific audience segment and um, touch points related to that audience segment relate, um, just to give an example, um, if we were to look at targeting young male drivers, um, some touch points that we could use we could place ads in targeted locations um, that could be at car shows or sporting events or maybe posters, um, you know, in the window of barber shops. Um, we also have used paid social media ads. Um, in, you know, are there specific um, clothing brands or celebrities, athletes, books, popular books or hobbies? Um, that where people have liked a particular page um, on social media where we can um, then have an overlap of reaching folks who um, like those pages with ads um, in their feeds. And then similarly, there's an opportunity through audio and video streaming ads where we could intentionally place them um, on a, you know, as part of a streaming TV program um, that's popular among young men. Um, or specific song, songs or musical artists um, on streaming platforms or podcasts. So 
just to kind of fill that idea out more. That's just one example. And additionally, I want to just add that um, this campaign will not be in English alone, but we also seek to reach um, Spanish speaking and Vietnamese speaking drivers and specifically looking at um, neighborhoods, community based organizations that we can partner with um, specific in language media outlets and cultural events. So as we move into potential touch points, we want to just give an idea of some of these touch points. And um, I wanted to first share about these digital display ads. Um, I know it could be maybe a little distracting to see that while I'm talking, um, but it's, um, I think we have all been on our computers, our phones, tablet devices, um, and one of the most cost-effective ways of targeting messages um, is through digital display ads. Um, we can look at um, even locations, like say there's a particular intersection um, that has had a, a fair number of crashes. There's a way that we can target devices that have gone through that intersection so that later that evening, those devices receive um, ads with our um, behavior change messaging. Um, commute time, radio and streaming audio is something that we've done in the past where uh, we often call it a mental speed bump that as I'm in the act of speeding, I hear somebody tell me to slow down. That can be a very powerful uh, way to reach folks. Other potential touch points, um, organic and paid social media. I just gave that example. Um, but in particular, when folks are um, on social media, they tend to be in a more of a lean back mode where they're just there to consume information. Whereas, um, you know, these days the, the advertising landscape can be very cluttered. There's so many things, but to be able to um, get people's attention while they're on social media, it's a very um, effective uh, opportunity to reach uh, folks with our messages. Uh, shareable videos is another way, uh, whether we send those through social media or they're on um, the Vision Zero website that people can link to. Um, I have an example here. This is a video that we created for uh, Vision Zero San Francisco um, showing the anatomy of a left turn, which uh, before working uh, on, the, on this project, I never really thought about all the complexities and kind of conflict points uh, when you make a left turn. So we had created this video to um, break that down and pre uh, provide some education um, and, you know, there's various types of videos. This is more of an educational one, but there's um, different ways we can use video media to um, get a message across. Um, next is out of home media, which may be the most common um, and familiar, whether that be uh, transit shelters, or I know that there is opportunity to do light pole banners and also um, even billboards. So where I've mentioned that digital marketing is very cost effective, um, we don't want to completely um, disregard the opportunity for out of home. We find that having a physical, tangible campaign presence, something that we know that everyone is seeing, can give um, just more importance to what our effort is. And we want to be strategic about those placements and purchases. Uh, but uh, certainly having some out of home uh, media will be important and then target uh, multicultural communities and seniors uh, through newspaper ads and often uh, these publications also uh, offer uh, advertising on their websites too. And then earned media as a way of garnering press attention um, can heighten audience awareness um, and in particular, I know that uh, earlier there were already some um, examples of um, high visibility enforcement events that have occurred in San Jose. Uh, but previously, uh, for for Vision Zero San Francisco, uh, they there had been a number of different enforcement events that were planned, um, and and we found that it was almost more important to publicize the enforcement than to actually, um, you know issue citations per se, because then there's this idea, this awareness in the public that that I, I should slow down because this is, you know, the enforcement is happening. Um, so in doing so, uh, we 
gave law, law enforcement officials um, outreach cards that they could um, give to drivers, uh, whether it was a warning or a citation that kind of went further with not just changing your behavior so that you can avoid um, getting a ticket, but that there are these consequences and this is how, de how deadly um, speeding can be. Um, campaign landing page that will be really critical as a home base for the campaign, especially with uh, digital ads with one click, you can take folks to a campaign landing page with all the main information that we want them to be aware of. Um, and also, you know, provide a URL um, on out of home ads as well. And then um, we also have it within our scope um, community outreach and that's something we'll um, go into greater detail. Um, as we get further into development, but these allow for high touch interactions and ways even to garner input from community members as well. So um, as we move from today and getting feedback on the strategy, um, our next steps include um, beginning to develop um, creative uh, for this campaign, um, those messages and visuals. And that's something we'll be sharing with the immediate uh, Vision Zero team um, in the coming month. And then uh, we want to further coordinate with, um, with the team on engineering and enforcement and measurement tie-ins. So again, as Chair Foley mentioned, the, the, this layering and integrated um, impact we can have as we work together to amplify one another in our efforts. And then we're going to get into more of the specifics of crafting media and outreach plans uh, for these various touch points. And that will happen in the first quarter of next year, um, all uh, with eyes on uh, a potential spring 2023 launch. So with that, I want to move into, I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> um, so move into task force strategy feedback. And uh, we put together a few questions um, to just help facilitate the discussion, but of course, any question is, um, we're open to any question. So uh, first, we're interested in just given this proposed campaign strategy, are there any existing or what existing channels, uh, communications, outreach uh, that do you have access to that can be leveraged for this campaign? Very well, there are things that we're not aware of. Um, even as we talked about uh, the adult crossing guard program and ways to market that, um, we're looking for that similar um, kind of input uh, of places and ways to get the word out that maybe we haven't thought of. Um, are, you know, what campaign targeting insights or input do you have to share? Um, is there anything specific we should consider, whether it's a particular audience segment or how to reach a particular audit audience segment through specific tactics or touch points? And then any other questions or comments regarding the campaign strategy? So I will pause there and uh, turn it back over. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I don't see any hands raised. So as you're thinking about your questions, uh, I'll, I'll just offer this. I'm, I, I, I hope this campaign works. Knowing how be the behavior of drivers, I wonder it, it, there, and, and the surveying you've already done with the focus groups, Deanna, it seems that there's really a lack of self-awareness that they as individuals are responsible for the bad behavior on the road, including distracted driving, mm -hmm. not paying attention. I know uh, there's higher fatalities turning left, but turning right uh, is where we have high levels of injuries. Ask anyone walking or, as a, or a bicyclist how that right turn affects them. Right. So I, I hope we're on target with this and, and and get some traction with it. But I'll listen to the comments of my colleagues to see uh, what suggestions they have. Councilmember Perales, turning to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely, I think as we talked about on the last um, item in regards to like crossing guards, I, I think each one of us likely has access to um, you know, a, a listserv of emails where we can, where we already send out 
uh, likely uh, regular uh, newsletters or emails. And so I think just using the task force is, is going to be a good uh, channel um, in, the, in the members here as we begin to, to do some of that outreach. Um, on the, the targeting insights, I really like the, the idea. I know I, I've mentioned this several times, but um, you know, my uh, early years driving as a, as a young male were the worst, uh, right? And it fits in, in line with, with the data that, that exists. And uh, trying to target that group, uh, I think we, we do have to be really thoughtful and specific in regards to, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we get into where they're going to actually see and read something? Uh, I think it would be wise to try to tap into um, the youth as a resource. Maybe this is a question that we lean on our, um, our San Jose uh, Youth Commission or, or, or try to get that input, right, versus a bunch of adults trying to think about what's the best way to... Uh, market to uh, our children. I think we, let's ask our children, right, and and kind of see where where they're they're looking at and, and how we might be able to get that info um, to them. The other thing in regards to the the uh, targeting, um, which I would agree, is it's almost uh, even better just as a scare tactic, right? When you say there's a DUI checkpoint or where you say there's mm -hmm. going to be you know traffic enforcement. Um, that works, right? You, you don't even have to do it. Um, you know, it just it just works on its own. And uh, we have the opposite problem at the moment because we have advertised the reduction of our police force um, mm -hmm. over the years. And we've also advertised the reduction of our traffic enforcement unit. And to the point where over the last decade now, it's been so depleted. Uh, not only was it advertised, it's felt, right? The community members are looking around going, I'm not getting pulled over, right? I'm not <laughs> getting stopped by by uh, traffic enforcement officers. I'm not seeing them out there as frequently. Um, I think that as the, the um, city hopefully begins to in invest in additional traffic enforcement officers, or even for instance, crossing guards or whatever it may be, when we're adding bodies, I think that that's, uh, those are good things to promote and to mention, right? Because you could even just say, hey, you know, San Jose is really investing now in uh in in you know the crossing guards or the the traffic enforcement officers that will in itself trigger um you know a response from some of the drivers where they, they may be more aware and more on the you know more aware of their own driving because like oh well, well san jose's hired more traffic enforcement officers so i maybe i should be more conscious about my my driving we're we're all guilty uh right of violating traffic rules it's actually very easy to speed that's why that's the number one factor mm -hmm. um and you mentioned that the the, the speed bumps, right? Virtual or physical or whatever, that, that, that those things that sort of, you know, um, come out and help stop you. The advertising can really help. One of the, the uh, infrastructure investments that we do is the speed radar signs, right? And they work. They work for me, right? Where you don't even notice that you may be going, you know, a couple miles over the speed limit and then it flashes at you, right? And you know, as you're going by, it's very, very helpful. So those are physical uh, right uh, elements that we put in. But I think on the campaign strategy side, uh, there's also those those non-physical uh, elements uh, and and more uh, virtual or obviously marketing type of elements that that I think do the same thing. So uh, I appreciate the the work and and uh, look forward next year um, as a, a civilian kind of seeing how this work progresses. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Chair Perales. And um, I don't even know if I finished my thought about earned media, but the idea yeah, that, people raising you know, hand. Thank you. But around earned media that um, we, you know, don't have to just pay for for um, attention, but the way that we can connect with, um, you know, the press to get different articles in the in publications and things can create this, you know, overarching um, effect that uh, people are aware of that there's more happening and, and increase awareness there without paying for it. So Diana, can you turn off your presentation for a moment if you don't sure. mind? Thank you. Great, thank you. Council member Perales, are you finished? Anything else? Yeah, that, that's it for me, thank you. Okay, great. Turning to Lauren with VTA. Hi, um, thank you, De Deanna, for that great presentation. I'm so happy to see what's uh, happened over the last several months. Um, I know that you are working with my colleague in our marketing department for this campaign. And so he, uh, I'm certain, are answering the first two questions for you in terms of how we can um, 
how we can have more media and uh, amplify your message. Uh, I did have a comment and a question. So one comment is um, when we, this is just for for everyone. When we, when uh, San Jose issued the request for proposals to hire you and, and hired you through a competitive process, the way that RFP was issued, it allows other public agencies to leverage that process to just hire you directly without having to go through a second additional or um, competitive process. And so here at VTA, we're going through our internal processes to hopefully bring MIG on board in order to do essentially a very similar campaign countywide focused on um, biking and walking safety. And it may end up that the actual messaging is also speeding. We need to look at the data to confirm that's the right way to go. But I'd expect in the next year or so, there will be some additional countywide um, messaging, which will be really exciting. And we're we're funding that with 2016 Measure B education and encouragement funding. Um, and then I had a question, which was, you talk about speed limits, um, and then maybe that's more understandable for, for most people, but in some cases, the, the, the speed limit that's signed on the roadway is still unsafe. Or I don't want to say it's unsafe. I mean, I it's too high. Mm -hmm. Are you focusing, are you targeting your message on just going under the speed limit? Or are you also going to be talking about safe speeds for the situation? If it's raining, if it's dark, if there's kids um, biking, if you're passing a bicyclist, if you're passing someone walking, there's all kinds of situations where you should go below the speed limit because it's just not safe to just do the speed limit. Sure. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, I think that we want to include some speed limit um, messaging. Um, it really also depends on what level, like when we're doing, um, you know, there'll be layers of messages. There's the, there'll be the very short form where we can only say a few words on a billboard. Um, but then later these outreach cards or even at outreach events, there can be, you know, things that have more information about the why and I think it's through the why that we will um, make a case for safer speeds and that it's not just, you know, specific to speed limits. But for some, I think um, even just staying at that speed limit, if they're going over, is also going to be um, helpful and contribute to some change. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Salvador, you're up. Thank you. Um, just a, a few notes, thank, and thank you for the presentation. A um, couple of couple of thoughts. Um, it's not uncommon to see monuments, candles, things like this on sidewalks and places like that. Or is there a way we can sort of maybe address or have a, an, an outlet for things like that, I guess? Mm. Um, and then, uh, and so is there also gonna be any sort of thought around uh, I guess, educating or reminding pedestrians who, you know, like, for example, you know, my, my wife, my mom and I, we go on walks in our neighborhood and it's actually a very dangerous, it's like there, we have sideshow intersections mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. Um, and they, my mom, I, I bought my wife, myself and my mom, um, high vis vests to wear at night, mm -hmm. um, if they're going to go walking at night. So, um, so those, those just kind of those kinds of things. I know we're focused on the driver. And I know we talk about victim blaming, but um, you know, common sense just says um, if you're going to go out at night, wear something that you can see at night. You know, we required bicyclists, you know, to have reflectors on their bikes and things like that. Um, anyways, just those kinds of thoughts. Um, and then, is there any other sort of messaging you can give to employers um, thinking about now that? working from home is much more com much more um, prevalent. Um, that's sometimes often being working while you're driving around in your car. So you're taking calls um, because our work life is more flexible now. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a message. Um, and I, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I mean, I have to drop off my child at, in the morning um, and we have a, 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 a daily weekly check-in at a certain time that I, I have to call into. So um, that's just one other kind of thing to to maybe think about as far as distracted driving and 
and encouraging safer work practices, I guess. Yeah. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate that input and those ideas. Um, in particular, uh, for pedestrian safety, uh, we have been talking about, especially in our outreach effort, um, to include messaging at, at, at that level, uh, whether that's, um, you know, as through community-based organizations or, um, you know, handouts at libraries and things like that, that we can talk about some of those safe, safe, safe uh, safety tips for, um, for pedestrians. So I, I think definitely, uh, again, we also are very conscious of not um, blaming the victim, um, but in this um, environment now, I think that it's, it's an important message to, to get out. So thank you. Salvador, anything else? Uh, I, I think, um, just, I just want to share that um, I've I pretty regularly shared that the fact that I, I attend a quarterly meeting, uh, that we listen to every single name or person who have been killed in a fatality crash. So for my friends who are saying like, oh, I'm biking more now, I think I just remind them, please be safe, be visible, don't ride against traffic. I mean, those kinds of basic common sense things, um, just to remind people of the sort of the the sobering work that we have to do, and maybe that might also be sobering for them as well. Again, listing names, going like maybe a PSA is lists all the names of all the fatalities that have happened this year. Those names are actually really impactful, I think. When, when we read the names, it, it not only acknowledges a fatality, an individual we've lost, but it shows the scope of what is happening on our streets. So if you see a large list, it is alarming and should be a call to action. But I fear our driver's behavior will not mirror that. I, I think we have a lot of selfish drivers out there. So how are we going to get to having them care about their fellow neighbor as they're driving? Hey, I'll get off my soapbox for a minute, but that's kind of frustrated about the speed at which people drive. Joe. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, chime in with Salvador's uh, comment, and I think the BTA uh, direction and uh, the chair's uh, comment. Uh, drivers feel safe in their vehicle, uh, and uh, the national industry has made them safer. Uh, and I think as a campaign strategy, uh, it's really important to also focus on the people outside the vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, just as uh, defensive driving is an important element, uh, I think defensive uh, uh, walking, defensive uh, bicycling, and even uh, defensive motorcycles uh, should also be a target. Uh, for this campaign, reflecting the impact of speed uh, on their uh, uh, their well-being uh, when they're outside of a car. And so uh, I would encourage the campaign targeting to also include uh, uh, the individuals outside of the, the vehicle uh, as part of the message. Thank you. Thank you. Great point. Thank you, Joe. Diana. Hello. Um, I just wanted to um, encourage um, that we pay attention to the infrastructure and design that actually supports and encourages um, motorists to drive safely. Um, I know sometimes I'll be driving down the road and the way in which the street will be designed, the bulb outs or the roundabouts, it lets you know, it indicates, hey, this is clearly not a, a thoroughfare, right? That it's a residential neighborhood and that I need to slow down. And then that's reinforced by a speed limit that was a 15 miles per hour. And I'll think to myself, yeah, I think that's about the speed limit that I was able to go on the street based on the design, right? And I, I think Deanna had mentioned that some of the uh, motorists were going with the flow of traffic, which is kind of concerning because the 
flow of traffic should be supportive of what we actually want them to be driving at. And if they're speeding because they're going with the flow of traffic and they're not aware that they're speeding because they're just staying up to speed with everyone else, that sounds like a design flaw that is allowing everyone to make that same er error and then encouraging others to keep pace with them. Um, so I want to point out uh, hopefully something we, we can look into. Mm -hmm. Deanna, thank you, thank you, Diana. <laughs> Deanna, question for you. So you, you've done a lot of these campaigns and you did one in San Francisco. How long does it take to modify behavior? And, mm -hmm. and how do you know that behavior has been modified? Very, very good question. <laughs> um, well, I think one thing that we've done is, you know, we did this baseline um, opinion survey. And what we've done in the past is we do a tracking survey so that um, after the campaign is completed, uh, we go back and ask the very similar questions and see if things um, have changed. And uh, one of the pieces of that survey is um, asking a question of, have you seen this, which is um, a you know, visuals from our campaign and even words from our campaign. And we find that those who have said, yes, I've seen that, they tend to have um, even more behavior change um, impact than those who haven't. Um, so there's that. I, I do think that this is, um, it's an ongoing thing. You know, I think changing culture and creating a new social norm, just it doesn't happen overnight or in a few years. I think there's something constant. And I think we've talked before about even um, the social norms around smoking or seatbelts, you know, that took a um, policy change as well as communications and education and infrastructure, you know, so, you know, I think that what we have ahead of us is a, a multidiscipline um, effort. And, um, you know, I think we want to, as we mentioned, integrate with different engineering projects, you know, capital improvements that are happening. Um, we found that, and this may relate to um, what Diana shared too, that some folks in uh, the focus groups were, had noticed um, some of the quick build projects, but they're like, we don't know what that's about, what that's for. Um, and I think they did recognize that it slowed them down. Um, but I think for us to even include that as part of our, um, outreach communications is to explain what that is and that this is an effort to improve the safety of our streets. I think that's an important message to get out versus people approaching those things as a nuisance versus, oh, this is actually something that is working in my in my favor. So I hope that helps answer the question. It, it, it does. Uh, it, it will enforcement or the it, it seems to me that there we're missing one component in in the speeding message, and that is that enforcement is going to occur. And to Councilmember Perales's statement, mm -hmm. we should be pushing putting out that we uh, are hiring traffic enforcement officers, even though we still have a lot of vacancies. We should still push that we have funded for them, and that we will have more people on the streets to enforce traffic. Uh, traffic violations. So are we finding, or will, will we be including, are you including an enforcement component in the messages? Because getting a big speeding ticket must be a deterrent, mm -hmm. isn't it? Not just a warning, yeah, yeah. a ticket. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think that is part of, um, I think what we want to uh, kind of coordinate and, and integrate with the efforts that are happening. Um, but certainly that is one um, lever and approach that we could take. Um, and very well, that, again, that may be not so much on a, a billboard per se, um, but uh, through some other um, kind of medium form length um, messages, whether that's uh, newspaper ads or outreach um, cards and things like that. I, I think it would be a great opportunity for us to partner with um, enforcement officials to, um, you know, just send the message to go a little deeper in terms of why speeding is dangerous versus I just don't um, want to get a ticket. But certainly um, 
getting <laughs> getting a citation or feeling it in your in your pocketbook is definitely a motivation among drivers too. Yeah, well, there's there's three prongs to solving this: education, infrastructure, and enforcement. The and and we're working on all tracks, mm -hmm. but we need to work more aggressively on on all tracks for sure. I just want to share a story on one of my Vision Zero corridors, which is Hillsdale. We did a lot of quick uh, quick build project that was completed not that long ago, and. I'll tell you, my residents are not happy that we've taken away one lane in each direction and put a lot of um, candlestick barriers in the middle of, in the median strips to prevent from left, tur left turns or U-turns. You're still seeing, I witness every day, unsafe driving, people actually driving into the uh, the bike paths that we have, that have been created protective bike paths, driving into it to create a third lane, just crossing through the candlesticks to make an illegal left turn. The behavior is just appalling. And I, I'm, I'm the worst driver because I'm just screaming at these people. Glad you all can't hear me because I'm using really foul language and glad my daughter isn't a child in the background because she would be repeating what I'm saying. <laughs> it, it makes me so frustrated that people believe driving fast is going to get them to anywhere quicker, which it really doesn't because mm -hmm. the stop light will stop them and we'll just catch up to them and continue mm -hmm. on our way in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've been in a hit and run a couple of years ago and it was, I was luckily not hurt. My car was, but, uh, could have been a real serious injury. It's just my car handled it extremely well. Mm. So it's scary. It's scary to me to be on the road because I've been in that kind of an accident. And I, I worry about the pedestrians. So the education is not just for the drivers. It is for the pedestrian too. We need to remind them. And I don't want to victim shame or anything, but we're all responsible for driving and walking while distracted. We have a device in our hands, we're bored, we're checking our phone and we're looking down, we're not paying any attention. And uh, oh, I could go on, I'm, I'm, it's just so frustrating, but this is our job. This is our job to make our streets safe. So hopefully you're getting the information you need, Deanna, to make a really robust campaign. Yeah. And I see Rebecca has raised her hand. So uh, your partner in crime, I see, uh, Rebecca, what do you have to offer? Well, I just wanted to add one other um, lever, which is technology. Um, you know, Deanna mentioned smoking and seat belts. You know, of course, cars, um, I believe, was it Joe? It was talking about how safe we are in our cars. Um, and that's because of so many technological advancements. But we also heard in the focus groups that in some cases, as people have gotten newer and you know fancier cars, those cars are preventing them from speeding, are giving them those alerts that we want to be putting on the streets. So just, you know, we have, as we're talking about policy, as we're talking about all the levers we can pull, I think that's a really important one that, um, we have emission standards for cars, and we can also um, be pushing for these safety safety enhancements as well. Uh, I agree. Although uh, some of the cars with newer technology have such big computer screens that they, <laughs> in and of themselves, are very distracting. So there, the 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 consumer wants these things. But it distracts them, and I don't know. <laughs> I, I I'm not well. I'm not ready to go back to the horse and buggy days. But <laughs> I want to be safe when I'm walking down the street. I want my people who ride their bikes. I want them to be safe. I want children to cross the street and get home safely. And I acknowledge that some of the people speeding at our schools are the parents themselves. Mm -hmm. So getting out that message is, is really hard. I, I look forward to the campaign as it, it rolls out. Um, any other questions on this topic before we wrap it up? If not, then I do need to mention that Michael Brio in, uh, joined us from uh, the planning department. Thank you, Michael. 
And I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Perales for some final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, get my camera working right. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and appreciate the dialogue today as well. Uh, I shared this message with my uh, colleagues, excuse me, <laughs> with my colleagues on the council, but I wanted to be able to, um, I think just provide some, some outgoing thoughts and advice as this uh, task force now is gonna round out its second year and, and start off its third. Um, I do think that it is important to think about what the, the future looks like uh, for this task force. And, um, you know, for me, I'm thinking that, that it would be wise to look at a, a more formal, um, and, and more permanent or semi-permanent structure for the task force. This is a decision that the, uh, ultimately the city would, would have to make as well, but then, you know, we would need buy-in from, from each of the members that are participating member agencies that are participating here as well. Uh, I think a, a committee structure, um, out of this could potentially, uh, you know, promote more uh, success in, in progress as well. I've seen that with our Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force. And, and uh, you know, I don't think anybody expected that to be going 30, 30 years, but, um, you know, but it is. Uh, we, we certainly hope uh, that's, that's not the hope for this task force is that, you know, we're going to still be in the same boat 30 years from now. Uh, but the reality is, is that we know that traffic related violence is is something that's you know probably going to be happening inevitably uh into our future but we want to reduce that uh, number as low as we can and, and and ultimately the goal is to get down to zero um year over year uh, i will say uh, i read a, a recent article on how well uh fremont is doing uh they got promoted for their uh traffic fatalities uh dropping significantly since they endeavored down their vision zero um, process back in 2015 as well. Uh, and looking over it, it actually uh, was very similar to all the investments that they were making that the city of San Jose is making. Um, maybe one significant change, it looks like 50 plus roads that they reduced the, the, um, the speed limit on, um, which is something I know I've been advocating for and, and your chair, uh, Council Member Foley as well and the council uh, as well. Um, but I believe we're doing a lot of the right things. Um, we, we have a much larger city uh, than Fremont and we need to do more of it, right? And we need to be able to allocate more resources. And that means we're gonna have to lean on, on partners uh, and partner agencies like those of you that are participating here. So uh, just some, some outgoing uh, words of advice and hopefully this task force finds some, some success uh, in the years ahead um, as we learn from what we've done over the last couple of years and, and then move forward. And I wish you best of luck, uh, Chair Foley, and, and I'll see, um, those of you who join us at 11:30, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your passion, your vision, and your leadership. And I'll see you in January in a different capacity, or or maybe not. If I'm if I if I'm not doing anything, then you need to come to me, or vice versa. <laughs> uh, with that, now we're ready for open forum. I just want to take a moment to invite the members of the public to speak on any discussion item. I'm going, uh, please adhere to our code of conduct. Speaker's comment should be addressed to the task force members. Request to engage chair, co-chair, task force members or staff in conversation will not be honored. Abusive language is inappropriate. Repeated failure to comply with this code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of the meeting may result in removal from the meeting. For those who have never participated in a Zoom meeting, there's a little raise hand button on your toolbar. Please click on that and you'll be placed in the queue. If you're calling on a phone, please call, please dial star nine to raise your hand and star six when your name is called to unmute yourself. Our DOT staff will instruct you to unmute yourself and you may speak. In the interest of time, we will allocate two minutes per speaker. Uh, it looks like we're getting, okay, we have some people dropping off. We do finish this meeting at 1130. I ask that the panelists uh, not respond until we've gone through all of the speakers. If there's time, then we may have time to respond, but it looks like we may not given the number of hands we have. With that, I'll turn it over to Anna Lee with 
uh, to facilitate our forum, open forum. Thank you, Chair Foley. Give me a second to set up here. You, uh, thank you. All right, the first caller is Gina. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, this is Gina LeBlanc. I'm mother of Kyle, who was 18 when he was killed as a pedestrian in 2016 in San Jose. I'm also a member of San Francisco Bay Area Families for Safe Streets. And um, once again, I'm horrified by all the fatalities and injuries on our roadways, uh, the last 17 that were killed since the last meeting. Um, I am especially concerned with the fatalities that occurred near the schools, and I'm so glad to hear you all talk about it and focus on that. Um, I was personally impacted by both of those crashes. I have a son at San Jose State, and I worked as a nurse at the elementary school where the little boy was killed. Um, I'm glad to hear uh, that this task force and Vision Zero will be, be, be prioritizing traffic calming near schools. And I'm glad to hear your 2023 work plan will be looking at schools. It's just so important. They're very vulnerable. Um, I hope you'll also look at the possibility of school street closure near schools just for drop off and pickup time. It's been done in other cities and it's something to think about. Um, I also attend the San Francisco Families for Safe Streets meetings and a couple of things that San Francisco is doing. They don't seem to have the same issue with names of victims not being released and I'm not sure why. Um, on World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims, which was just November 20th, we labeled 250 flowers with the names of all the fatalities since 2014 in San Francisco. Um, another thing they're doing is that they will be putting out their high injury fatality quarter map every two years or three at the most, not five years. Um, and I also wanna thank council member Perales for your conscientious work on this task force and for answering my emails and always remembering my son, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Hi, my name is Mary Lou Avanzino, and I live uh, on Edenville Avenue, and I want to first thank you for increasing the amount of time a uh, public can speak to two minutes. One minute is really short, and it's hard to communicate any idea without speed talking, and it shows more respect to the general public. Um, I'm pleased to announce that after trying for four years to get street calming measures on Edenville Avenue, that's the street that Hayes Mansion is on, speed bumps were installed this month. Thank you, DOT. Unfortunately, only three humps were installed, and that was not enough. I had understood there would be six. Where another hump is clearly needed is where Cherry Ridge Lane tees into Edenville Avenue. I was surprised it wasn't obvious to DOT staff that this was a conflict point deserving a hump. I've communicated the need for a hump at Cherry Ridge Lane to DOT staff and was told DOT will evaluate Edenville Avenue speeds in spring of next year. Having to wait another unknown number of months or years, if it happens at all, is an example how slow streets, how slow street smart improvements occur in San Jose. And one reason I believe San Jose is struggling to reduce, reduce deaths on our roads. DOT, don't delay installing speed bumps on Edenvale Avenue near Cherry Ridge Lane. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. Christine, would you like to admit yourself? Uh, thank you. I'm Christine Fitzgerald, community advocate for the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. I use a wheelchair as do many of our clients and we're often um, put at risk for being hit and at left turn um, intersections. One, suggest one strong suggestion would be to incorporate such things as speed bump of, of sensors throughout that turn uh, radius and um, looking at what we can do to better educate the new drivers coming online. 
both at uh, at high schools and at um, DMV offices, with more rigorous and um, uh, timely uh, renewal of their not only their licenses but their knowledge of the driving uh, features and education that they need to have and should have and are required to have as drivers. The, uh, the issue of uh, education should not be limited to strictly starting drivers or senior drivers, but all drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Blair, would you like to unmute yourself? How about that? Hi. Hi. I can smoke it. <laughs> Hello. We hear you. Okay, people are going all over the place here. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, thanks for the previous speakers. Um, I guess for myself, thanks for this meeting today. Um, I was impressed with some of the words about uh, wanting to address uh, speed limit issues and uh, or speed issues, I guess is a better way to say it. There was a, a Vision Zero ceremony at a city council a few weeks ago, uh, San Jose City Council, that was uh, interesting and had people uh, there and some interesting words, uh, you know, about uh, that talked about a future of less car use, actually, by Councilperson Foley herself. And one of the uh, Vision Zero community regular persons uh, spoke a few words uh, about, uh, you know, that we, if we just look out for each other and, and make the steps to want to more openly talk about how to look at each other as we're driving, you know, to take those kind of actions, uh, it just really, uh, it struck me well, it, it, it hit upon, <laughs> I'm using those kind of words, uh, it, it put, a, it, was, it was in a good place inside myself. So uh, good luck how to work on speeding issues. I thought of the idea, you know, we can consider asking people, you know, you have a car, you can just simply, you know, take your foot lightly off the accelerator and that can save a lot of time for people, a lot of, a lot of heartbreak and, you know, things like that. And so, um, you know, I'm interested how, how we can be addressing these issues in the coming months. I think something can be hopeful. Good luck with that. And as always, uh, you know, in all the tech that you're going to be doing with these new practices, we don't need a whole ton of law enforcement, I feel, and tech. Uh, we need accountability and openness to work hand in hand with this process. Uh, that has to be our democratic future of good practices and community harmony and the real, vis real vision of Vision Zero. Thanks. Thank you, Blair. Gail, would you like to admit yourself? Hi, good morning. How's everybody? I wanted to say thank you again for a wonderful meeting. Congratulations, Pam, on your first chairperson meeting on this committee. As always, it's wonderful and very educational. I wanted to ask, or <clears throat> I wasn't sure if this was brought up. Most of the meeting, I pg e was in my house, so I had to be with them. But I was wondering, since you have this wonderful um, work plan for the next year's work plan for um, school safety. I was wondering if there is any way to also have a work plan around senior centers and what we can do to provide Sounds like we lost her. Let's sorry, no. Can, can you anyway, hear us? So, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Did I mute my unmute or anyway? So right. I was just wondering if, if that can be incorporated. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is um, we're putting together a questionnaire, and I'm going to run this hopefully maybe past uh, Jesse and um, to go that we are going to go to all the senior centers and community centers and talk to seniors about traffic and pedestrian safety. So um, it's just the thought of maybe we can do the same thing with the work plan around senior centers. So thank you. And again, this meeting was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Arturo, would you like to unmute yourself?
Arturo. Maybe I will go back to Arturo a little bit later. Jordan, would you like to unmute yourself? Hello, thank you for uh, having me. Um, this is my first uh, Vision Zero meeting uh, in San Jose. And so I don't know exactly um, how the agenda is set uh, each time or what was what you covered at the last meeting or the next meeting. Uh, but it's sort of odd to me, this being my first time, um, that the, the only concrete topic that we really talked about at length was communication. Um, given that we sort of, it was stated during the presentation that communication alone is not likely to drive uh, major improvements by itself. Um, it seems to me a bit weird that it's the, the first and only topic that we were really discussing at length versus, um, you know, traffic calming or other more concrete steps to actually uh, change how drivers behave. Um, you know, myself being a driver, um, I know that, you know, more than anything, the, the road itself often dictates how fast you drive. If, if a road is really wide with wide lanes and multiple lanes, you're going to drive faster regardless of what the posted speed limit is or what any other signage on the road is. Um, that being said, I do have two ideas about communication. One is for someone mentioned the the signs that report your speed back to you. I feel like that's actually very effective because it tells you where what you're going and it's almost like a game to go under the speed limit when you see that. The other right thing is that I often see people blowing red lights a lot just outside of my um, intersection. And I remember in Mountain View where I lived last, uh, there were resources that people didn't even know about for reporting intersections uh, where traffic violations are being, uh, violated a lot. So I think uh, communicating resources is important. Thank you, Jordan. Arturo, would you like to unmute yourself? Arturo? I'm sorry, for some reason, I don't have any luck with Arturo. So let me go to the next caller. Um, Phoning any number 4608, would you like to unmute yourself? To unmeet yourself, 4608 caller. Hey, I have no luck with Arturo and the caller ending 4608. Hello. Oh, hello. Perfect. Arturo? Got him? Yes. Yeah. No, no, this, this is Herb Bowen at 408. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorry. 472, uh, 4608. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Quickly, I'll go through. Uh, thank you for, for this task force. I think it's important for our city. Um, a couple of items that I have is uh, I was wondering if we can get some bike lights for the underserved. Uh, we have some issues with them running around at night, like over in Burnell. And I've he almost hit a gentleman running around, but no lights on his bike. So maybe the bike group could help us with that. Hello? Yes. Thank Hello? you, good idea. And then a couple other things. I, I have an um, outstanding uh, DOT issue with the school, Las Paseos School, about a blind curb. And I'm, I'm going to follow that up with uh, the people doing it. But do you guys track those, uh, uh, any kind of issues around schools or traffic out of DOT? So, so this is a public forum. If you can share off your comment in two minutes, and then if we have time, we'll respond. That's fine. Okay. Let, let me, let me, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so, and also I was wondering too about school signs for your campaign. A lot of schools had electronic signs, signage that you could use. And then the other one was, I was wondering if you meet with the 
detectives the SJPD on uh, their investigations when there's a homicide or a vehicle uh, hit and hit and run. So those are my f- first questions, and I'd be happy you know, if anybody wants to send me information, kd6irg at yahoo.com on answering the questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council Member Foley, I think I think I that's it. Arturo. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, we were never able to get Arturo in. All right. Thank you for the public comments. We we do uh, we don't during the open forum we do not respond to the public comments. We listen to what they are and uh, respond at a later date if we can. If you have need any information or if you have intersections in your district that you're concerned with, please reach out to the local council member and they can start working on advocating for you and taking a look at that or directly through the trans- the Department of Transportation. But when I have an issue in one of my district, in one of my areas, they usually come to me and my uh, transportation staff person who's on this call, Kyle, responds and we do some investigation and see what kind of traffic calming we can do in a particular area around a school or area, er, anywhere actually. Um, And with that, uh, so has, I have concluded my first meeting as the chair of this committee. Woohoo, I made it through without creating too much of a blunder. This is a really important task force. We have really important goals that we need to make sure that we work towards and uh, make our streets safer for everyone. I look forward to our next discussion in the first quarter of 2023. Everyone, please be safe. Please drive safely, drive defensively. And if you're walking or riding a bike, do the same. And I will watch for all of you on the streets. Please take care and have a wonderful holidays. I'll see you sometime in the spring. Thank you.